We're taking you home on the drive at five. Well, hi, welcome. This is a brand new show. We're glad to have you along. Uh, and if you're driving, thanks for the ride. This is a brand new show, the maiden voyage of a show called Dealing with Life. Uh, we're going to talk uh, through uh, every Thursday about uh, things that affect your life. We're going to talk with people who have had things happen to them and how they found victory. And they found God in that story. And we're also going to talk with people who help others who deal with difficulties. My name's Tom Baker. Uh, I'm author of One Dog's Faith, a book about uh, faith, life, and worry through the eyes of a dog. And uh, it uh, is written by my dog, Mango. I helped a little. And it, uh, it's it's a fun little book, One Dog's Faith. With me in the studio today... A very good friend of mine. We've known each other for 30 years. Mm. Larry Trotter. We met at eight, right? We were eight? Eight. Yeah. Eight and a half. Yeah. No, you were eight and a half. I was eight. <laughs> you were eight. You're older. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Larry uh, Trotter is senior pastor at Concord United Methodist Church. We met when uh, we were both in radio. Not too many people remember it, but it was a station called U-102. And uh, that was the 80s. Yes, it was. There was radio then. There was. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they had cranks on the side of them. Yes. They did. So um, what, and, and I knew you when. I knew in, in the party days of radio, we, uh, life was a little different than it is now. Really? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to, first of all, I want to talk to you about how you got I knew even before in radio, you were a, a touring musician, a guitarist, and a singer. That that sounds that sounds a lot better than it really was. <laughs> Very we, glamorous. We, tra- <laughs> we traveled in a in an old. We traveled in a Braden furniture truck that we bought that was already shot, was used and shot, and we bought that thing and uh, carried our gear in about a sixteen foot Braden furniture truck and and a Chevy Vega. Oh my! And a tele and a telephone company back when there used to be a telephone company in one of those uh, olive green vans. So that was our little caravan that uh, went through the southeast, playing clubs and bars and any place that people would sit still and you know give us money. So Anybody with a brain would see you coming and run. They would run to grab your children, pull them out of the way, don't let them get close. So that was probably your college ish years. It was. It, it was. Yeah, right. I, I went to UT for. For one year, uh, and well, that's not really fair. I was enrolled at UT for a year. <laughs> right. It's completely disingenuous to say that I went to UT because that implies going to class. Yes. So, uh, but but it was a recipe for disaster. When I was eighteen years old, grew up in Sevierville, so went went to the big city. Lived in a house with my brother and somebody else uh, to go to UT. Uh, back in the quarter system. Okay. And at the same time, we started a band that summer. And uh, this uh, this place where I lived was actually a big house that was part of the Admiral Motel, which is an, an Exxon station on Magnolia Avenue now, the corner of Magnolia and Cherry. Gotcha. And uh, the guy who owned it, his dad had bought it for him to run while he was in school. He said, I'll buy this little motel, and you can run this motel. It'll teach you about business. He's a lawyer now. Um, and... Um, and you can use that for money, run the motel. So, so the, it had three bedrooms and a basement. So we, I had my brother and I shared a room in that house, and then our band practiced in the basement. So we started, a, I was living off campus uh, for my first quarter at UT at 18 years old, living in a house with, with two other guys and starting a band. Now, sharp contrast I, I from ne- high school. Never had a chance. Oh, yeah. You know, when, when in all actuality, what I should have done is gone to the Marines. If I, I would have never made it, I, right, I couldn't. Have, but the military would have been a better choice because I, I had no sense of discipline, very immature. And, um, uh, you know, I didn't go to class. I went a little bit, but, you know, I, I basically got all incompletes. Gotcha. Uh, which would come back and 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 remember that because that plays into the story later. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bookmark there. You <laughs> guys got mildly successful. That we well, you know, it depends. We were able to stay. We toured the southeast. Tour. Yeah, and we did. You know, we played the southeast for for um, three or four years. You know, playing clubs and and uh, occasionally we might do something bigger. But basically, we we're playing clubs, some original material, a lot of cover material, which you had to do. Um, 
and and that was and we learned a lot you know it's 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 a very very hard life i learned more than uh, the first thing i learned was i'm not cut out for this uh to uh, to play all night sleep all day uh it's it's a terrible environment uh, the glamour it, went away the, it, you know, only bad stuff grows in the dark <laughs> you know yeah. uh nice stuff doesn't grow in the in the dark it takes daylight okay. and so when you're in the dark so take us from there to being a pastor well, you know, it's funny. Uh, down the road, we uh, we broke the band broke up. I had and and we had this drummer. My brother had left the band. This drummer. So I'm so I'm sitting in this little hovel of a house on on the Severe Avenue, Moody. I guess it was on Moody in South Knoxville. And we had band had broken up. We divided up all the equipment and the money. I had nothing. I had nothing. The heat was off. It was in February. The heat was off because Yikes. I didn't live there anymore. And I was trying to figure out what to do. And I was I was crushed because I really thought we were going to we were going to make it. And you're going to uh, play arenas. Oh yeah, yeah. any yeah. day somebody's like you come in and and write a write a contract on the back of a cocktail napkin, you know. And Yikes. there we go. That okay. didn't happen. So so it turns out the drummer um, was a Christian. And as I was sitting there in the floor in my little house with no power, uh, with candles burning, and he was staying there at the night, and then he was going to go back to Miami the next day, he said, he just walked up and he said, would you like to pray? And you could have knocked me over the feather. I had no idea. I said, well, hey, at this point, sure, why not? Let's just, yeah, yeah, let's try everything. So we prayed, and I wound up in tears, and I didn't understand what was going on. As I look back now, there have been a lot of touchstones. It's like stepping across a river. You step here, and you step on this rock, and this rock, and this rock, and eventually you get across the river. Yeah. And that's what, that was one of those rocks. I didn't realize it at the time, but that guy, uh, it was amazing. Uh, and, and it was that first thought of, I still have a faith background that I grew up with. So that was kind of kind of random background, and I went into radio and, and uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do. My dad said, well, I'm helping a guy start a station in Athens. You can go down there and do that. So so did that, Went to worked in the radio business, and then, of course, um, went uh, came back to Knoxville, started working at U102, and that's when we met all right. along the way, uh, just, you know, partying and still playing a little music on the weekends, but mainly doing the radio thing. And then whenever Lauren, our older daughter, was three, which would have been in 1988, okay. Lynn and I, who had nothing been nothing more but creasters up until then, mainly to placate my mom and dad, who loved it when we came to church in Sevierville. Now, for those not in the know, what is a creaster? A creaster is someone who goes to church Christmas and Easter. Gotcha. Okay. So we were creasters, and uh, my mother, you know, uh, loved that. Uh, but we weren't interested in going to church. We were partying, and we were just living our life. And then when Lauren was three, God played one of his trump cards. And God gets you uh, uh, thinking about this idea. Well, you know, we were raised in church, so maybe it would be good for our daughter to be raised in church. So by golly, let's find a church. So that's what we did. Okay. And we were going to go to Bearden United Methodist Church. Guys, I grew up as a United Methodist. And we were leaving our little house on Middlebrook Pike at that time. And we were, we were at the red light where Middlebrook Pike Church is. And I looked over, and, I, and, and because somebody at the radio station worked, uh, went to church at Bearden, and I said, well, there's Middlebrook Pike Church. It's like a mile from the house. Why don't we just go there? And we did. We could walk if we had to. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And they just swallowed us up. They were, you know, the people there were so friendly. We got involved in a Sunday school class. Um, and, you know, worshiping was wonderful. But then, then I started he reading the Bible. I'd never read the Bible as an adult. This was been 88, 89. And then they had this greatest thing the Methodist Church has done in a long time called the Disciple Bible Study. You basically study every major theme of the Bible in nine months. You meet once a week for about two and a half hours. You've got all this reading in between. Then you come and you talk about it with a pastor or a facilitator. And the Holy Spirit just works through this group experience. And all of a sudden, I met God on God's terms. I'd always assumed because I'd been a musician and I'd done some bad things in my life and I'd done some things I wasn't proud of. I'd always assumed that God could never love me, really, because I'd made such bad decisions, kind of cordoned him out of my life and, uh, for a long time. And then, but then I met him on his terms and I realized uh, that um, he did love me uh, because he chose to, not because I'd given him reasons to, sure. simply because he chose to before I was ever born. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you, and Jesus died for me. And that was just when I finally came to grips with that, that Jesus actually did what he did for me and knew it and knew what kind of a jerk I was going to be at times, did it anyway. Died for me? Are you kidding? <laughs> so, 
So it just changed everything, literally. And then, and then I started teaching Sunday school. Then I took this training to become a disciple Bible study facilitator. Okay. And suddenly I realized that I'm getting more out of this than I am my job. And at the same time, you know, the radio station's doing well. And I've become the program director. And we're having record ratings. And things are going really well. Booms Day's happening. And got all this great stuff going on. Working for a big company that owns multiple stations. But I'm more fulfilled doing my church stuff than I am doing the radio stuff. I could never imagine myself old. I could never see myself beyond about 40 years old. In the radio business. In radio business at that time. Right. But I could picture myself as this old preacher, you know, this old little ball-headed guy sitting out on the deck, you know, (laughs) watching the birds come and drinking coffee. And I I could see myself as an – and I thought, you know what? I can do this. Well, the world was calling you saying, here's a great successful career, and you're good at it. Or right, and that, but right, and God came in the middle of that, and and so I'm thinking, what do I know about being a preacher? And then God starts saying, well, why don't you j- actually, actually, my pastor at the time, Gil Smith, uh, was the one I talked to him about this a lot when I was wrestling with the call, and I said, you know, I wish I'd started so long ago. I spent that time on the road and all this time in radio, and and Gil said, well, why don't you take all that stuff and give it back to God and see what He can do with it instead of regretting it? It's all gotten you to where you are. So uh, in 1992, I uh, I told my I got up the nerve to tell my wife, uh, and after about a year of wrestling with this, that was about 91, and her response to me was, "Well, I wondered when you were going to tell me." Oh my! <laughs> she knew she was just going to let me come to her with sure. it. Sure. And uh, so anyway, you know, so I went to the local district superintendent of the Knoxville district, and I said, "This is what I'd." I'd like to do. And he said, <laughs> it was so funny. He said, well, tell me, if you don't mind, how, how much do you make now? So I told him what, how much I made in the radio business. He said, do you have a bachelor's degree? I said, well, no, <laughs> I don't have any degree. And he said, well, if you want to do this right, you need to get that so you can get your master of divinity and become an ordained elder. And he said, that's going to be six or seven years of school. Are you willing to do that and come out and make half what you make now? <laughs> you wow, know, how promising. Gulp. <laughs> And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I can do that. <laughs> so really, that's when it started. And then I, they got me a church. I got my first little church at Dutch Valley, which is in Anderson County, north mm-hmm. of Oak Ridge. Precious little church with precious people. Continued to work full time in radio. Um, it got my church, and uh, we had 54 members, and uh, and just had the time of my life preaching. You know, preaching every Sunday and uh, pastoring those people. And it was just such a blessing. Wow. So, but if you tie it together, God was able to, to, to take all these loose ends and all these things that you have talent in, but, but weren't really glorifying. And, and all of a sudden they became one nice little package. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I was able to start playing my guitar again and playing the church. I did that at Middlebrook Pike when I was a member. I remember the first time I ever played a song there in church, I had my acoustic guitar and I sang a song and uh, for the, the choir director had asked me to, I was singing in the choir and I sang this song and I got, I had more fulfillment out of singing that one song than five hours of playing in a, you know, in a club where you're just a back, where you're just, you're really just a soundtrack for guys and gals to hit on each other. I mean, that's <laughs> yes. real, that's all yes. it is. And, and it's like, man, people are actually listening and this music is meaningful and God was ministering to me and then using that to minister to other people. And they were saying, you know, I really felt the spirit in that, you know, which is no, not, not, not because of me, but because of what God does. And it was just so, it was just incredible the way he, and then, you know, all that time in radio, the one thing radio teaches you is how to think and talk at the same time. Right. And, right. and, and that comes to play uh, or comes to bear on preaching in a very powerful way. So that you can find a way to talk and uh, uh, and and keep your, the point in mind and 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 maybe speak in a way that actually will capture people's attention and allow God to work through that. So yeah, so suddenly all of that, he's like, I can do, I can work with that. God's like, yeah. I can work with that. Yeah, you know, let's let's give that a shot. So now you're at Concord United Methodist Church. Concord United Methodist. I've been there for almost sixteen years. I was there for. 15 years as as the associate I, I i left i went from martell uh from dutch valley to martell i was there for six years which is a mega church that one had 150 members <laughs> uh, but uh, you know it grew we bought some land we were going to build a building there and 
uh, we God really blessed the effort, and I was using my guitar. We started some contemporary worship and using all that. Nice. And then I was called in the middle of all that to come to uh, the bishop asked me to come to to Concord, and I said, "Can't do it." You know, we we just bought property. I can't leave this church. And and he said, "Oh yeah, you can." He said, I, "You you said <laughs> he said I said I've really been praying about it." And he said, "Well, I've been praying about it too." And he said, "I'll tell you what, if 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 you don't think you should come to Concord, then you can come to my office and we'll pray about it together." And I thought, well, when bishops well, say that, it's like okay. Yeah. So he was a very wise man, and and of course I never looked back and came to Concord and and got to really experiment with worship there and and meet wonderful people and and just grow as a human being, preach every Sunday in front of, uh, I was preaching, you know, I was all all of a sudden preaching in front of, you know, four or 500 people, you know, on a Sunday instead of a hundred. And not that that's, and that what makes that, what's significant about that is the way it pushes you and it caused me to grow very quickly. And so, um, yeah, and then so a year ago, uh, uh, when or about a year and a half ago, our senior pastor retired, and the church asked me if I would if I would want to become the senior pastor, which I'd never considered that really up until the last couple of years before that. Right. Um, but I said, yeah, you know, at that point I was over I was sixty one, and I thought, you know, we have so many young families coming to the church. It would be great to have an associate who's younger, have a younger face, and I can continue to preach and lead worship but we need younger we need younger blood so well the magic is is point a to point 10 uh you're an incredible guitarist and musician and you helped craft the contemporary service there and 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 use your music talents oh and what a blessing that is to be able to to be able to do that you know it was a good service before i got there they they'd launched it about 2 years before i got there and it was one of the earlier ones in in this area but I, but it, uh, I, what I was able to do is just take it from there and uh, you know, experiment with the music and experiment with media and just try to take it to the next level and and do more because we have so many wonderful people. It's uh, it's great whenever you have so many wonderful. You, anybody can think up anything, yeah. but when you have great people to pull it off, that's what's that's cool. even that's <laughs> magic. That's when it's cool. We're talking with Larry Trotter, senior pastor of Concord United Methodist Church. Uh, when we come back after a short commercial issue break. Commercial. I remember those. Yeah, they, they still have them. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about uh, your uh, interest and your gift in helping other people. This is Dealing With Life, a brand new talk show. We'll be back in just a second. We're taking you home on The Drive at 5. But I need you to love me. And I... We're back. This is Dealing With Life. You are experiencing the maiden voyage of a brand new talk show. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith. And with me is senior pastor Larry Trotter from Concord United Methodist Church. We talk about in this show, Dealing With Life, about issues that people face and the choice that you have of either uh, taking it on as a, as a challenge or letting it get you. So as a right. senior pastor, I know that uh, it's not just giving sermons every week. That's, that's a, a percentage of what you do. Right. Yeah, and probably not as big enough a percentage, but... Right, you know, <laughs> but but uh, you uh, a lot of your time, I'm assuming, is is helping people deal with life. It is, um, I, you know, and the first thing I want to say is that you know, I, I've what I've learned is to if if someone you know really has a, a problem, particularly if it's an addiction issue. Um, uh, they have a marriage in trouble. You know, I can't, those are the, uh, uh, the last thing a lifeguard who can't swim wants to do is jump in and try to save somebody. So I'm not <laughs> trained to do that. Okay. You know, uh, and I've learned over the years when to say, you know what, that's over my head and we'll both drown. If I try to pull you out of this, let me refer you to somebody. But what I can do is, is listen to you and pray with you and be your friend. And that's really what pastoral counseling as far as I'm concerned, is really all about. And so people people will pour themselves out to you and tell you what's going on in their life, and you have an opportunity then to give them at least a different perspective. 
You yeah. know, I figure if I can do that, then that maybe that'll help. Well, I, I my limited experience of dealing with with severe problems or uh, st- uh, struggles is you get so focused on that one thing that you forget so many other things that that are that are blessings and are things that God's trying to say, "Hey, dude, come on." Right. And that's a, that's a really good point. And in fact, the only time in my life that I recall ever having an anxiety attack, when I was first coming into ministry and I was working full time at the radio station, we were under a direct format competitor attack. Um, and it was, of course, my job as a program director to respond to that. Our company wasn't giving us a lot of support. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, go to school at night to get my bachelor's degree so that I can go get the Master of Divinity. And, uh, oh, yeah, I've got two children and a wife. Uh, and then I was driving to support one of our church members. That was when I was at Dutch Valley. I was just going to go with her to be w- with a friend who's, who I think her, her father had died. I was just going to a funeral home. I, I wasn't doing the service. I was just going there. Okay. Uh, and and I, so I'm driving, and I get to Oak Ridge, and all of a sudden I can't breathe. And I'm just I'm gasping, and my chest is heavy, and I thought, well, here we go. I've read about this. Um I pulled off, my palms are sweating, and then my heart is racing. And I thought, but I realized, okay, I'm not, I'm not dying here, but something's wrong. So I just turned around, drove back home. I sat on the couch and gathered up my girls and Lynn, and we just, I just sat on the couch and cried and felt better. And uh, the, the Holston Conference, which is the area that our church is in, they had a pastoral counselor. And I'm going into all this for a reason. So I went to see that counselor. I said, you know, this is weird. I, I need to see about this. I don't want this to happen again. Sure. So I went in and, you know, and he said, so tell me, uh, he's a really nice guy. He's not around anymore. He's, he's gone on to the church triumphant. But he said, tell me what's going on in your life. And so for about 20 minutes, I go through, well, I'm, I'm in school now, uh, full-time at night, trying to get my ba- a bachelor's degree so that I can go to seminary. And I'm full-time in the radio business, working about 60 hours a week. And we're under attack by a, co- a format competitor. And then I'm trying to serve this church. And, all, and, and so I'm just laying all this out. Sure. And he's, and he's looking, and he's just grinning. And, and finally, I stopped, and I said, so, so am I missing something here? What's so funny? And he said, well, I just wondered when you were going to pause and, like, deal with any one of these four or five major life crises that you're in the middle of. (laughs) That that you're doing all together. Did ever think to you you might ought to stop and deal with one of them? And what he did, and this is is the payoff, the gift he gave me was the gift of perspective. Because I had let all those things pile up in front of me, and I was jammed up so close to them that I couldn't see above them. I couldn't see around them. I couldn't see anything but all of this conflict and all of this stress. Uh, And I didn't think there was any other way to live. And so what he did then for me was to break it down and unstack them so that I could see over the pile and see that there actually was a life out there beyond all that. And it was just this gift of perspective. It's It's what God gave Job. You know, when, when God comes down to talk with the famous, fabulous line from the King James Version where, where God comes down and, and looks at Job and says, gird your loins, <laughs> just love that. <laughs> yeah. it wasn't, that wasn't um, original in The Devil Wears Prada, you know. Or with Gladiators. That, with that character, yeah. yeah. So, and, and what God does then, he doesn't dress Job down as much as he gives him perspective. Job, look. You didn't. You didn't pour out the oceans in the uh, in the palm of your hand. You didn't carve these mountains. You don't know when the the mountain goats have bear their young or how many me. Job had never considered that. Oh and yeah, so, there's that. <laughs> so he gives him this gift of perspective. So that's what I try to do when I talk to people is help them see where they just need a, a breath of perspective. Sure, and I think I think what you went through, you could almost insert most people's struggle and, and situation. And see the same kind of common thread yeah. in that. There's this old preacher trick. It's an it's an as a preacher illustration where you where you get a dime out and you tell you ask people in the congregation, you've got a dime in your pocket and everybody pulls their dime out. Now hold it up right up next to your eyes. Now can you see anything? And they're like, No, right, you know, and you so and the, the point is you could use this dime to block out Mount Lacan. You know, well, if you hold you it, if you hold it close enough to your sure. eye, you can. Sure. But if you'll just put the thing out there a little bit, get some perspective. Suddenly, it's not as big. We worry so much about some things that are insignificant. That that leads me to uh, a question I have for you. You see a lot of brokenness, uh, and yeah. people come to you. Do you see a common thread in the things that people face or they deal with? You know, I 
One thing that I see, uh, and, and Concord is, uh, even though it says Concord, we're not in Concord anymore, haven't been since 1960. We're in Farragut, uh, but the church moved there, from, but, but it's still called that. You know, it's a very affluent part of the county. It's the right. most affluent part of the county. Okay. And sometimes people think, well, what do those people need a church for? They don't have any problems. They're all rich. Well, first of all, they're not. You know, there, there are a lot of people in, in the Farragut area that have a lot of stuff, but they're also leveraged to the hilt trying to pay for it, mm-hmm. which brings on its own set of problems. Yes. But but the problem is for some people, not everyone, and certainly not everyone in Farragut, and I'm not generalizing, but what you can run into are people who say, you know what, I built this company, I built a company. I did it all myself, the old Jeffersonian individualism, rugged individualism, which built this country, and it's great. Mm-hmm. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, and I did it my way, to, to quote uh, Frank Sinatra, but the fact of the matter is you didn't, and you can't do everything yourself. And so, you know, people, when we go to talk to them about faith, they go, I don't need God. I've Not God done, at all. I've done all this stuff myself. Yeah. It's a whole lot easier to talk to someone in in, uh, in South Sudan, which I've done, about God, you know, because they trust God for the for the next drink of water. They trust God that uh, somebody won't come in and raid their village and kill them in the middle of the night. I mean, their life is fragile, and they know that God is the only thing they have that uh, between them and, and uh, infinity. Yeah. And so they trust him. It's no problem. Uh, but here we think we're also, and not just Farragut, but anywhere in this country in particular, we think we're so smart uh, that we've got it all figured out. And so one of the problems is people are slow to get help. Because they don't think they need it. I've got this. I can do this. I'm in control. Exactly. And um, and then and then when they discover that one of their kids uh, is using drugs or that the spouse had just walked in and said, I don't love you anymore. I'm out. Um, or um, you get that layoff you didn't expect. Or we're moving you to Sheboygan and you're going to have to move the whole family next week. Or the C word. Uh, or the C word drops. Yeah. And that's what you see a lot. Yeah. Oh my gosh, cancer is something everybody else gets. Um, and, and so then they're, they're out of resources. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a resource for that. Well, exactly. It's not things that money can necessarily fix. Right, right. So then they'll come and, uh, you know, they'll come ostensibly just to, quote unquote, let someone know. I hear that a lot. Well, I just want to let you know. And then an hour later, after they poured everything out on the floor, <laughs> yeah. you know, of the office, uh, they uh, they feel better because they've they've admitted by letting someone at the church know whether it's me or one of the other pastors by just coming and saying that they've admitted to themselves I can't handle this yeah that's the first step. My definition of worry is fearing something that you can't handle or you don't believe you can handle. Right, that's good. I, I think that's really good. And, yeah, and and I think that that is the the, uh, the beginning of a lot of struggle. Absolutely. Um, and and I know personally, I went through some serious issues a couple of years ago, and my first option could and should have been talk to my pastor, talk mm-hmm. to you mm-hmm. about it. And I was the same way. Yeah. I got this. Uh, yeah, I yep. got this. And right. all the time, the world was crumbling yeah. around me. Right. And uh, the one, the one, t- when I figured out and I admitted to myself I'm failing, then it became worse. Mm-hmm. Then I internalized it, mm-hmm. and no one can help me. Right, right. And and uh, and then I started more than anything. I didn't have faith in my faith. Mm-hmm. And, sure. And that's a hard place to be. It absolutely is, um, because you're afraid the faith will let you down. Yeah. And then, and and if you do have some faith. Uh, and you know what? There, there are those. There are, um, there are th- theological systems, and there are ways of having faith. Where, uh, and you, you see this on television a lot. And I hope nobody gets mad at me for saying this, but, but you, you know, suddenly faith gets wrapped. You know, your your life and its outcomes, uh, ha- it becomes this quid pro quo thing with your faith. If you have enough faith, if you're being obedient, and you're doing things that God's going to bless you, and life's going to be a pony ride. Right. But the other side of that is then whenever life isn't a pony ride and, and everything fouls up, then it's like, oh, my gosh, God's, God's mad at me. And, and this is all happening because my faith is bad. So then not only does someone you love have cancer, but now you're questioning your faith. Yeah. Well, if I'd have had enough faith, then this person wouldn't have gotten sick or I wouldn't have lost my job or this would have happened or that or would have happened. Or maybe God doesn't love me. Right. Maybe God doesn't love me because this hasn't happened, because this is not happening for me like the preacher told me that it would. And it just infuriates me. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's so easy for us humans 
to to drop to that. It and, is, and, and quickly. It, it absolutely and quickly. is. You know, God wants. You know, God doesn't promise us anything, uh, and yet uh, other than, but yet it's everything that He will be with us always. We're gonna always un- and always. We're going to unpack that here in a second. Okay. This is dealing with life, a brand new talk show. My guest is Larry Trotter, Senior Pastor of Concord United Methodist Church. I'm Tom Baker. We'll be back in just a second. We're taking you home on The Drive at Five. We're back. We're on a new talk show called Dealing with Life. Really nice to have you along. Hope you're enjoying it. I'm Tom Baker, uh, author of One Dog's Faith, a book about life, about faith, about worry through the eyes of a dog. With me is Senior Pastor Larry Trotter of Concord United Methodist Church. We've been talking about dealing with life, and uh, I'm really glad you're you're here with us today. We we left off a second ago about talking uh, who God is and, and his love for us, but I think what we, and I know what I have done in my life, the definition of success, whether it's climbing the corporate ladder, being this mm-hmm. big, huge business owner with gobs of money and a big uh, boat in the back of my uh, yard that has, of course, a lake on it, uh, when something like that disappears or all of a sudden falls apart, God doesn't love me. Right. And, and it's scary. So um, as a pastor— what what are your thoughts? Where do you, where do you take somebody who is now broken because their dreams are shattered and they don't think God is taking care of them? Well, you know it. it and I always tell them now, get ready because I'm about to tell you what you came here thinking I was going to tell you. But that's what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> You're right. Because of the difference it made for me. I mean, you know, you should be. I should be getting uh, double pay for this show because I know not only I'm one who have been broken, and and also the one who's supposed to talk to me. So I, I feel full both of those you roles. Know, you're the next two, th- three week <laughs> guests. Okay. <laughs> we talk about, when are we going to talk about my problems? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but you know. Uh, when, when the biggest problem I had before I started coming into faith really as a grown up and reading scripture and figuring it out for myself, appropriating the faith for myself, I was much like Jacob in scripture. I was living off my father's and grandfather's faith. Gotcha. You know, at some point you have to appropriate it for yourself is that I had this vision of God that was very small because God having no background in scripture, uh, God uh, can only without a background in scripture, without any reference there, God can only be as big as your own imagination. And if you don't think much about yourself, which is probably the biggest problem that runs through this country, and I don't know, maybe in other places, is that we just don't think much of ourselves. You know? We have an image that we try to create for others. Exactly, exactly. But inside, we're dying because that image bears no resemblance to who we think we are. Yeah. And uh, and and so then we shrink God down. Because God can only be as big and as powerful as we imagine he could be. And, uh, and, in sudden, and suddenly, we have made God in our own image, which is That's 180 dangerous. degree yeah. polar reverse from what this is all about. He made us in his own image. Uh, and God has this really beautiful idea about how life ought to be lived in relationship with him. And when we do it from his perspective, when we read the scripture, do some daily devotion, listen to some music, pray on a regular basis for heaven's sake, then suddenly we let God be as big as he actually is. And he's actually so big that whatever is happening in our life, then that's the perspective I was talking about. Suddenly that doesn't seem quite so insurmountable right? because we realize that, uh, that God does indeed have this. And, and he can help us through these things. But that's the biggest issue, I think. Um, people, because, they have so, because they're so down on themselves, um, then, then Im- the image they have of God can only be as big as that image they can create. And it's not very big. Yeah, and, and we have such high expectations on things that we think we can do. Yeah. And if they don't glorify him or they don't have him in the picture at all, then even when we get there, it's not rewarding and it's not enough. And right. and right. we we always have that emptiness of going, this I don't know, then what's gonna make me happy? Yeah. And yeah. when it falls apart, 
And, and, and life has a way of doing that. If things that we think are going to be the greatest things of all or this big success, and when it falls apart, then we're just looking around going, okay, now what? Yeah, because we're the center of the universe. Yeah. And so the whole universe has collapsed because we, our life has collapsed. And so with nothing being bigger than that, then everything has collapsed. It's all lost. There's nothing. Yeah, and, and that can be hopeless. Well, it can. It absolutely can. And what, what I try to get people to do, and even before they get to the point where they're broken, is to – one of the things that we're focusing on so hard at our church right now is to get people involved in mission, to get people well, – our, our, our mission statement is sharing Christ, serving others, growing in faith. Um, and the, getting involved in a hands-on ministry – Doing what Jesus does, the best way to feel close to Jesus, the best way to feel that presence that he promised us, that's his promise. I'll be with you, and I will never leave you. I will die. I died for you, I, and I would do it again because I love you so much. Yeah. Uh, we have to put ourselves in a place where he would be. Uh, you know, we can we can engineer him right out of our life if we want to. He won't sling his elbows and say, let me in, let me in. But he's always right there going, you know, hey, I'm, 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 I'm here. I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> you know, uh, as, I, as I've said before in a, to other people, um, you know, any time that, that, that every decision we make, God, he, he gives us that autonomy and that freedom because he loves us so much. He gives us freedom to make our own decisions. That's, that's part of love. Love has to be free on both sides of the equation. But God is always right on the other side of that decision. Whatever choice we make, God's right there. He's right on the other. It's like a doorway. Okay. He's standing right there. We have to make the decision on our own. Now, he will inform us. He will help us make the decision, but he won't make it for us. He lets us choose. It'll it'll feel right or it'll feel odd. It will. It will. And if it feels right, that's when we realize we opened the right door. And <laughs> there he is. Boom. Yeah. You know, it's not like he's not with us as we make the decision. And I don't mean to say that, but he won't make the decision for us because of that autonomy, yeah. because he loves us so much. But if you take but, money out of it, and I have learned this only recently, if you do something and you take money out of the picture and you say, God, if this can help you, and if I can do some kind of service with this, it always works. Oh, it does. And that's gigantic. That's the piece, you know, that, that you can't sell people on because they think you're, you're, you're being self-serving about it. When I tell people, you know, if you really want to feel fulfilled in your walk of faith, if you really want to feel close, close to Jesus, roll up your sleeves and get involved in a hands-on ministry and look out. Here it comes. Tithe. Ooh. Give. Give beyond what you're comfortable with just a tiny bit because i've done it both ways yeah. and not everybody can ride out of the chute you know when i when i came out of seminary i didn't have debt i was very blessed that i was able to get scholarships i didn't come out with debt but i didn't have much money not making a lot of money mm -hmm. and so lynn and i actually still bought that lie that we weren't making enough to tie that that biblical level yet and so we didn't it took a while but um, we kept working at it working at it to get there and and when you do that, it's ever it, it 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 you live in this reality of trust. Well, I'm just going to trust God with this, and I'm not a believer that you know we give so that we can get back. I hear that too. Sometimes I hear giving uh, made out to be like some kind of Ponzi scheme. You know, well, if you'll give God this, and He's going to give back to you fivefold. Yeah, but not necessarily money. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. That's the that, that's the equation <laughs> breaker. Yeah, I mean that would be great. Why wouldn't everybody be a Christian if that were the case? Sure. You know, but but what He does, He does bless you immensely with this peace and this incredible sense of being a part of something bigger. And that's what people need when people are broken, when people are feeling like life is out of control. They need what you need to do is place them in a bigger context so they can realize it. And that's the beautiful thing about the church. That's why we need the church but to, so that we can be a part of something bigger, something that has a goal beyond making money, nothing wrong with making money, nothing wrong with having boats and nice houses, sure. nothing in scripture that says that's a bad thing. It's just that we need to remember how we got it, if we have it, and we need to give God glory, uh, glory for it, and we need to glorify him with it somehow. And also, one thing that, I, that I've learned is you need to be willing to let go of it. Yeah. If you can let go of it, and if, and if something happens to it, you're not totally destroyed— yeah. Then, then it's okay. See, God walked the rich ruler right up to that door. He wouldn't. Jesus walked him right up to that door. 
the guy walked up and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, and yeah. Jesus looked at him. He knew immediately the situation. And, uh, you know, the guy proved himself, hey, I, I honor my mother and father, and I don't lie, and I do this and I do that. And Jesus patted him on the head and said, good boy, one more thing. Only one thing you need to do. He walked him right up to the door. One thing. Yeah. Oh, whoa, whoa, what is it, Jesus? I'm ready. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Boom. You can hear that, that note in the big movie scene. Oh, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. That's it. And uh, the scripture says he went away sad yeah, because he had much and he hadn't thought about that. Um, and, and that's, that's what I mean by, you know, Jesus wouldn't make that decision for him, but he walked him right up to it. If you, if you would do this right now, he, he was telling him, if you would just do this, just do this. And you're there. Yeah. You're in. Yeah. Uh, it's not that he had to do that to be saved. He had to do that to understand the depth of salvation and, and what Absolutely. Jesus was doing for him. I mean, I've been in situations where I faced losing everything, the house, the yeah. cars, the everything. Mm -hmm. And at first, for a couple of years, um, <laughs> I, I, it, it just scared me to death. Of course. Uh, I, I worried night and day about it. And then God finally helped me understand, okay, if you do, it's still okay. Right. I've got things going for you. Your family's awesome. You've got friends. You've got things that you can do to make yourself fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally realized that, the stress was down to a quarter. Okay, so... Right. Then we'll just go a different direction. Yeah. Then we'll go enjoy something else and make an right. adventure. Right. And yeah. that's so hard to let go of. Well, it is because we get that's where we're comfortable. But this is the way I do it. This is how we do it. And then and we can't imagine there being another way. But there are lots of different ways to do it. Yeah. And uh, God has that perspective, but we don't. Life is full of changes. Yeah. The only time we aren't guaranteed change is standing in front of a vending machine. But it's our ability to adapt and embrace it exactly. and say, God, maybe you got something cool going on here. Exactly. I think it was Edie Wiesel. It was, I don't think it was him. It was, it was somebody else. And I'm sorry, I can't remember. It was somebody who actually uh, did. Uh, oh, uh, almost uh, Victor Frankel, Victor Frankel and his incredible books that he wrote about, about challenge and about, about overcoming you know, he he was in a concentration camp, if I'm remembering correctly, and maybe some listeners may go, no, Trotter, you know, go back and read. But I'm pretty sure <laughs> that that was the case. And I think that he had, they had, they had, he was in a concentration camp. They had killed his family. They took everything he had, and they were trying to break him. And he looked at them, and he said, you know what? You can do whatever you want to do to me, but you cannot make me hate you. You Ouch. can't do that. Oh you my. don't have the power to do that. And and that grew into this thesis of this book, which was essentially uh, there are many things in your life that will happen that you have absolutely no control over. Sure. But you have 100% control over how you respond. And that changes everything. Yeah. I tell couples whenever we come, they come for premarital counseling, I said, you know, uh, there's a, f a high percentage. It's not 50 percent, but it's a high percentage of people who will get divorced. And especially in the state of Tennessee, it's not great. And I said, that's the, that's the bad news is there is a pretty good percentage of divorce, but here's the good news. At the end of the day, there are only two people on the planet that will determine whether or not you get a divorce or whether you make your 50th anniversary. Only two people, only two people get to make that decision. That's totally true. Yeah. And, and we let so many other things attempt exactly. to control. We us. let other people decide for us. Absolutely. This is dealing with life. Brand new talk show. Uh, we're talking with uh, Senior Pastor Larry Trotter of Concord United Methodist Church. I'm Tom Baker. We'll have final thoughts. We'll be back in just a second. <laughs> 